I am Mr. True. In this video, we are going to introduce the structure of a two-column proof and work through three examples of using these proofs. These are what uh, or how our proofs are going to look in the geometry class where we have a column for statements. Now, when we do these geometric proofs, we're going to be given a piece of information and then based off of that be asked to prove something else. So that given information is always going to be the first line uh, or statement in our two column proof and then what we're being asked to prove will be the last statement. <clears throat> in between there we need to build some logical steps kind of like linking a chain together getting from the given statement to whatever it is we ultimately want to prove. Now we've learned a lot of postulates, excuse me, definitions, theorems so far and properties, those are going to be need, we're going to need to know uh, what those, the names of those theorems are, or at least know what uh, they say. A lot of the postulates don't really necessarily have a name, they're just numbers. So we might, in the reasons, be just stating or writing out a sort of uh, abbreviated version of that postulate that you're using to validate that the statement that you've made is indeed a valid one. So that means that we're going to have to do a lot of memorization of what are those definitions we've learned so far and know what we have learned so far in the textbook. Uh, me being a teacher and have gone through geometry many times, I need to constantly remind myself, okay, what definitions have we learned so far, such as uh, we've talked about midpoint of a segment or an angle bisector. Um, you know, in, what the, what's the definition of congruency and make sure that I don't use definitions that are still have not been discussed in our class. I mean, they may be even in a textbook, but my students don't actually know them yet. Postulates, we've talked about how, like, say, two planes intersect a line or two lines if they intersect, intersect in a point or two points define a uh, line. Uh, properties, we're going to remind ourselves of some of the algebraic properties that we've learned in the past year that will need to come up in these two column proofs before we do our first three examples and any theorems that have been already proven in the textbook. Remember theorems are must be proven postulates or statements of fact that we don't need to prove in geometry. Uh, now we're not going to of course pro uh, you know, prove these theorems inside uh, you know, some other proof but um, they'll need to have been discussed and proven in the textbook. Also when you talk about these reasons uh, and these statements, again, it's a chain. So sometimes these statements will have to be made in a particular order. Um, and if you get that order wrong, uh, the logic won't connect together. Now, the first example that we take a look at is simply going to be solving a, an algebraic equation, something we're very, very comfortable with. And we understand the steps uh, that must be taken to do those problems. And we understand this, the order of those steps, hopefully, if you did well in algebra, to be able to solve those algebraic equations. And we'll put the, be using mainly properties of equality on the side to validate each one of those steps. But in geometry, a lot of times you're going to be given scenarios and you won't see, you know, you won't look at it immediately and understand what is the sequence of those statements that are, uh, what's, what will be required to finish the proof. You know, and that with complex problems often will be the case. You won't necessarily in the beginning or even once you get comfortable with these proofs, just look at the scenario and go, okay, I know exactly what sequence of steps I need to go through. So very often you might just need to make, uh, look at the diagram, look at the given information and make as many true statements as you possibly can in your proof. And if you have a selection of uh, statements that can be made without seeing the sequence, it might not in that case matter what order those statements are in until ultimately you start to see enough of the facts out of that given information, out of that geometric diagram to where you can start to see that chain develop and you start realizing what links need to be filled in to finish um, the, you know, to connect the given statement to the statement that you're trying to prove. So you may often just need to start these proofs and start making statements without really understanding where uh, or what the link of logic is to get from point A to point B. I am noticing, uh, and many of my co-teachers are noticing, a trend uh, away from having you guys develop the proofs on your own. More and more it seems like textbooks are giving you proofs that are sort of half finished and all you have to do is finish in one link of that chain or maybe the entire proof is actually done and all you have to do is recognize the properties or definitions or postulates or theorems um, that validate those statements. Uh, that's certainly makes it easier on the students, but it certainly does take away the possibility that you have the uh, 
the well possibility that you have to strengthen those skills of looking at those complex situations and start to build your own logic chain because that logical problem solving uh, skill, those skills are extremely important in life, uh, you know, outside of the realm of math, being able to look at difficult questions and or scenarios and create uh, a solution process to those. But uh, at any rate, when we do my proofs, the, the ones I do in the videos, I'm not going to have them uh, sort of halfway pre-set up for you. We're going to try and talk our way through them and understand and develop those steps needed to get from point A, the given, to point B, the final line that we're trying to prove. Let's review some properties of algebra and equalities uh, and properties of congruence and geometry before we get to those three proofs. All right. Hopefully you remember these from algebra. If you don't, then you have uh, quite a few more uh, properties to remember as we go through these proofs. Addition property. This is when we would, we would be solving an algebraic equation and we would add the same number to both sides, maybe trying to move a uh, negative, maybe we have 2x minus 5 and we're trying to add 5 to both sides to cancel that negative 5 out and move it away from the variable. So if a is equal to b and c is equal to d, then a plus c equals b plus d. Now, <clears throat> when you're solving algebraic equations, you're always adding uh, the same variable, the same, or excuse me, value to both sides of the equation. Uh, with geometry, uh, as we build these proofs, we're given information about segments and angles and, you know, tr whatever, uh, that sometimes we'll, we'll be adding what has a different name to both sides of the equation, but earlier we would have had to, sta had to have stated uh, that those two names or values uh, that we're adding to both sides of the equation are equal. So uh, that's why we have the C and the D and not just, uh, you know, if A equals D, then A plus maybe F equals B plus F. Because in geometry, often we are, again, adding maybe the, the name of two segments to uh, each side of an equation, but we've already had to have been, had a state that those segments are already equal. Same thing with subtraction, of course, just subtraction instead of addition. Multiplication property, if A equals B, then C times A equals C times B. So if we have two values that are equal, and we multiply the same value to both sides of that equation, or to both of those items, they will still be equal, just maybe larger or smaller. Division property, same thing. <clears throat> if A is equal to B, and C is not equal to zero because you can't divide by C, then A divided by C equals B divided by C. Look at all those if-then statements, by the way. Why didn't we just have that in our geometry book, right? Uh, the structure of if-then statements. Substitution property. If A equals B, then either A or B may be substituted for the other in any equation or inequality. Uh, the substitution property is mainly used in uh, algebra when you are given an expression, maybe like you know, 2x squared equal 2x squared minus 7, and that's just an expression. There's no equal sign or inequality. And then later on, it says, you know, what would that expression equal if x were equal to 7, where they said, you know, something was equal to something else. We would take that 7 and plug it in for x in the expression and uh, continue to evaluate the, uh, the expression and find out what it's equal to. So we've already been doing substitution property. Again, the geometry with names of, using names of angles and vertexes and whatnot um, will make that just a little bit more complicated just in the, in the structure of the variables and the names, but uh, still just using the substitution property we learned in algebra. Wait for a second. Reflexive property, where we have a equals a. Uh, that is required to say that something is actually equal to itself, which seems kind of weird. Uh, an example where maybe you would use the reflexive property is when you have two angles that are adjacent because adjacent angles will share that common side. Well, that common side is part of each of those individual angles. So um, you do need to state that you know, the one side of this angle is equal to the one side of this angle. Of course, that's going to be the case because it's the exact same side that's being shared by those two adjacent angles, but still uh, in these proofs, sometimes you need to kind of, let's just say, state the obvious, uh, because if you were doing, say, computer programming, uh, that computer doesn't understand what obvious is. You have to give it every piece of information it needs to solve a problem or work out a sequence. Symmetric property, if A is equal to B, then B is equal to A. In other words, you can just take an equation and flop, uh, switch sides. If uh, if x is equal to 7, then 7 is equal to x. And transitive property. If a is equal to b and b is equal to c, then a is equal to c. It's really very similar to the 
substitution property. Uh, let's say I'm just taking B out and plugging in what it's equal to. Uh, but the transitive property is specific when you have these, this sort of like train of events uh, where um, A is equal to B. B is then equal to something else. And, it, the, and the train can continue. Maybe C is equal to something else, like D. And D is equal to E. And E is equal to F. And then ultimately you can say, well, you know, I have this train of, of uh, equalities, so let's just cut out the middle part and say that the beginning, A, is equal to the end, you know, whatever that is, in this case, C, because that's how short the train is for the transitive property. Transitive, kind of a train of equalities. Get it? All right. I got uh, some properties of congruence, and then we'll get to those three examples of your, uh, for your geometry proofs. Here, we got a few more uh, properties here, uh, the properties of congruence, but we have reflexive, symmetric, and the transitive property. It's just going to, I'm just showing you how they look in terms of using geometry notation as opposed to the algebra notation we had on the previous screen. Uh, the, let's see, if you have segment DE that's congruent to segment DE, or angle D is congruent to angle D, uh, we've got the same kind of uh, statements for symmetry. Uh, we can take these equations, whether it's about segments or angles, and simply switch sides and have equivalent statements. And the same is true with the transitive property. Just the same except for congruency statements with segments and angles. Now, one textbook I'm using to develop my notes from pretty much just says that these statements here, that two segments are congruent, is interchangeable with the statement that these two segments have equal length. Uh, I'm including this for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because I have a textbook that says these are interchangeable and I have another one that uses the definition of congruency to go from, let's say, this statement to this statement. So they're using that definition of congruency in uh, a step of their proofs. That tells me that you know, whoever wrote that book does not feel that these are interchangeable. Indeed, this is you know, a statement of congruency, uh, basically that you have geometric figures or shapes that are the same shape and same size, and these statements are statements of measure. That's the distance between DE is equal to the distance between FG. I'm pointing that out as well, just to remind you of notation. Segment DE, distance between DE, without that segment mark above it congruency symbol, and just an equality sign. Angle D is congruent to angle E. Congruent angles have equal measures, okay? So be careful of that notation. And I'm going to include those statements about uh, that you go from here to here or vice versa using the definition of congruency. Uh, your book may say that those statements are interchangeable. Uh, I have books that say either or. So uh, just be aware that as I go through the proofs, if I make a statement that maybe your teacher says, is not necessary. So let's get to those three examples now, finally. First example. Given that 2 times 3x minus 1 is equal to 10, prove that x is equal to 2. Now, this isn't uh, algebra where I'm giving you the solution and asking you to verify or check it. Oh, we can do that right now. 3 times 2 is equal to 6. 6 minus 1 is 5. And 2 times 5 does indeed equal to 10. So. I know that x equals 2 is the solution. I just checked it. What I want to uh, do is prove that that's the solution. Uh, in algebra, we just would not have given you this in the first place, and you would have just solved the equation, which is basically what we're going to do. Uh, I'm just doing this example to show you the structure of a two-column proof and show you that we're going to start with the given statement as the first statement. Uh, so number one is going to be that 2 times 3x minus 1 is equal to 10. And the first reason for every proof is, well, that's what you gave me. To, you know, that's the piece of information that you gave me. So that is given. Now we're going to work through a sequence of solving this equation until we get down to that point that x is equal to 2. And then, because we are you know, doing geometric two-column proofs, we need to write down the reasons. Basically. Um, you know, some standardized tests are actually starting to ask students to do this as well, not just work out a solution, but explain what is allowing every step to occur. What are you doing to get from one line to the other? And also, as you go along these proofs, let me just reiterate again those if-then statements that we learned. Uh, you know, if this is true, then the next line is going to be true. And then if that is true, then the next line is going to be true. Those if-then statements are kind of basically what we're doing, logically stepping through uh, all these statements to get from uh, 
the given statement, point A, if you will, to point B, the last line, which is what we're trying to prove. Now, this is just a uh, multi-step algebraic equation, so I'm hoping that you can work this out on your own. I'm going to sort of just pause the video here and give you a second to try and work out the um, algebra, at least, which is, should be review, to get this problem solved. Now, notice that I have my equation solved and steps that I learned in algebra are required to solve multiple step equations. Uh, but it did not show the work, the scratch work inside the proof. That'd be a little bit messy. If you really need to um, show the work to solve this, maybe do that on the side and then fill in your proof. But uh, we do need to, while not showing, uh, well, I did with this step here, but you know, I didn't show the addition of two to both sides. I didn't show that I actually divided six to both sides of the equation. And by the way, what I'm just telling you I did uh, that's basically the names of those properties that we're going to use to validate each of those steps. You know, how did I get from line statement one to statement two? Well, I took the two and multiplied it through the parentheses. What is that property called in algebra? It is the distributive property. What did we do to get that negative 2 away from the x on the left-hand side and move it to the right? We added it to both sides. So that was the additive property of equality. Or I'm just going to write addition property or prop of equality, the addition property of equality. And then finally, what did we do at the last step? Well, I divided both sides by 6. So division property of equality. Okay, now over here, so here's our first proof in geometry, uh, at least in the form of a two-column proof. Given the measure of angle 1 equals the measure of angle 3, prove that angle DOB is congruent to angle AOC. And in the diagram, we have it in symbols, the given statement that the measure of angle 1 and 3 are equal. So let's start with that given information. Measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 3, and that was given. Okay, now with this proof, a couple of things need to happen. Uh, but the biggest thing, of course, is I need to somewhere bring in the name DOB and the name AOC. But, and this is the hard part about teaching proofs, is I'm going to give us, a, you know, I'm going to give you a sequence of statements and reasons, but uh, with this particular proof, it's not the only logical sequence of those statements. So you might come up with a proof that is also valid and also flows logically, but is in a different order than my statements. Is that wrong? No, not necessarily. It can be, but without having someone else very comfortable with proofs look at your work, it is kind of hard to uh, you know, know whether your statements, unless you analyze your own work, uh, are right or wrong. This is not going to be the only order of statements that will get this proof solved. So um, be aware of that as I walk through this. I'm just going to look at this. I'm not really sure uh, what I can state here, except that um, I see that angle DOB, DOB includes angle 2, and AOC, angle AOC, if you look at those names, both of those encompass the middle angle of 2 that has no statement about it yet. Uh, but both DOB and AOC both have a part within them of angle 2. So let's stick with the numerical names for now and just say that the uh, measure of angle 2 is equal to the measure of angle 2 and anytime you say the same thing on both sides of an equation or equal sign, excuse me, that is your reflexive property. Okay, well as I look at DOB and AOC, I see that DOB is made up of two angles inside that one larger one and same thing with AOC. Now, ultimately, I'm trying to prove that these angles are congruent, which means that their measures have to be equal as well. So if I can show that the two parts that make up angle DOB uh, add up to the same measure as the two parts that make up AOC, then I can say that those angles are congruent. Now, I've got a statement here in statement one that one, measure of angle one equals measure of angle three. And now if I take this equation, an algebraic equation, and I add the same thing to both sides, I'll still have 
a statement that is true and equal. So if I take the measure of angle 2 and I add it to both the left and right hand side of the statement, uh, which has been given as being equal, it is still going to be equal. That's the additive property of equality. So we're going to have the measure of um, angle 1 plus measure of angle 2 is equal to the measure of angle 3 plus, and I'm running out of room, so how about just measure of angle 2 down here. So I'm taking this statement here and adding the same thing to both sides. You've been doing that in algebra for at least a year now, probably more than that with your pre-algebra classes. So this is the additive property of equality. Okay, so now I've got angle one, measure of angle one plus measure of angle two. Well, one and two add together to give me angle DOB. So I'm ready to also make a statement that brings in uh, that name of DOB and that name of uh, AOC. So, um, so you have to watch me write this. Let me just pause and do this uh, real quick. Now, I wrote that out. I said that DOB, the measure of DOB is equal to the measure of angle 1 plus measure of angle 2. And same thing with measure of angle uh, AOC is the measure of angle 2 plus measure of angle 3. Uh, what was that um, postulate that said that we could add those, those two parts to equal the measure of a bigger part? That was the angle addition postulate. Uh, we have measure of angle 1 plus measure of angle 2 equals measure of angle 3 plus the measure of angle 2. So this statement, 1 plus 2, is equal to 3 plus 2. So 1 plus 2 is equal to DOB, and 2 plus 3 is equal, equal to AOC, but we just said in a previous line that this statement here, 1 plus 2, measure of angle 1 plus measure of angle 2, is equal to the measure of angle 2 plus measure of angle 3, so thus, Measure of angle DOB must be equal to the measure of AOC. I'm going to do substitution. I'm taking this 1 plus 2 out, and I'm going to replace it with DOB in the statement. And I'm taking this 2 plus 3 out and replacing it with AOC in the statement. So I'm going to basically rewrite the line that I gave in statement number 3, but with the name or statement of measure of DOB, measure of AOC, that is going to be the substitution property. Okay, finally, uh, we have the measure of angle DOB is equal to the measure of angle AOC. I'm going to go ahead and use that definition of congruence to then rewrite this statement into what we're actually trying to prove, which is not that they're not just that their measurements are equal, but the statement is specific for congruency. So, because these two angles have the same measure, now angle DOB is going to be considered by definition of congruency congruent to angle A. O C. So definition, I'm going to just put DEFN for shorthand there, definition of congruency, just really shorthand that statement. So your proof does not need to be in this order, but what needs to be done is we need to say that angle 2 is equal to itself. We need to realize that these two parts are going to make up DOB and these two parts are going to make up AOC and bring those together. Uh, allow those parts to add together and bring us in the names, those three, those three letter names of those uh, larger, more complex angles until ultimately we can make a statement of their congruency. Got one more example. Here we go, here we go. C is a midpoint of segment AB. Prove that X is equal to 8.5. So we have, a, we have a diagram here that looks like, well, it's geometry, but uh, this is going to be kind of similar to the first example where we move into um, uh, sort of basically just an algebraic proof. Uh, we haven't really learned that many theorems uh, in geometry to you know, build up the complexity of our geometric proofs too much. So we're going to kind of start off with geometry appearing and move into algebra. So C is the midpoint of AB. What does that mean? Well, it means that segment, oh, it'd be nice if there's some letters up here. How about A, B, and C? So that means that uh, if C is a midpoint of segment AB, then a midpoint breaks up a segment into two congruent parts. And my name here is as far as, you know, given as segment AB, not distance AB. So that means that from here we can say that if this is the midpoint, that segment AC is congruent to segment uh, CB. And ultimately that means our lengths are going to be equal as well. I don't know why I just added that. So uh, let's see here. Segment AC is congruent to segment CB. 
and that is going to be by definition a midpoint. And the writing's not quite as good when I'm rushing. And if those segments are equal, then that means that their lengths are equal. So if AC is congruent to CB, because C is a midpoint, and by definition a midpoint, we have two congruent segments, then distance AC is equal to distance CB, because um, congruent segments have equal lengths. And we can see from our diagram that the length of AC is equal to 5x, that the length of CB is equal to 3x plus 17. So we can take AC out and plug in what it's equal to, which is 5x. We can take CB out and plug in what, it's it, what it is equal to, which is 3x plus 17. And I took AC out and plugged in what? I took CB out and I plugged in, I substituted. So that's the substitution property. Well, now we're just solving uh, the, you know, the last two steps of an algebraic equation. Let me step out and get that up there. Maybe you want to just pause it really quick and get those last two lines out and make sure you remember those properties of equalities that we're using to get this equation solved for. Bam! Well, there you go. Your first three examples of two column proofs in geometry. Uh, from this point on, a lot of our videos are going to be introducing new theorems and proving those theorems and allowing those new theorems to build up our knowledge base of geometry and develop more and more complex two column proofs. And these proofs are going to kind of repeat for quite a while uh, now as we go through our lessons and add on again our list of theorems and start learning those. Remember, please work on memorizing those theorems and don't forget your postulates and definitions along the way uh, so that you have all of those facts you know, at your disposal, at the tip of your tongue if you will on the back of your mind ready to be used anytime needed as you go along these proofs because they will be a challenge and if you don't know those basic facts and maybe some of them are so basic but they'll need to be as you get through your study of geometry if you don't have those facts in the back of your mind ready to go uh, it's just going to make trying to develop these proofs which are already kind of difficult even harder so I'm Mr. True. Bam! Go do your homework